Okay, so it's now 11 o'clock, so we're going to begin our presentation and our tour around tulipans. And this time we're going to emphasize frogs and turtles that live here and a few other amphibians and reptiles that live here. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Joyce Bluford. Most kids call me Dr. Joyce. And Debbie will join us later on. Um, she's, dry, she's in um, Montana right now, so she'll, she'll be coming in and out probably on her phone. But this is uh, frogs and turtles have traditionally been grouped together as herpetology. So even though frogs and turtles, although they're both vertebrates or an animal with a backbone, people a long time ago used to think that they kind of belong together, but they don't actually. So that's where that term herpetology, and if you want to study amphibians or rep reptiles, you're called a herb herbatologist, so the study of amphibians and reptiles. So I want to make sure we know the difference. It's really important because they are very, very different and they play a different role here at tulipans. Now amphibians are vertebrae, that means they have a backbone. So if you look at these pictures here, these are the backbones. Just like we're mammals and we have a backbone. Unlike us who are warm blooded, we control the temperature of our blood. These guys are cold blooded. So that's why sometimes when you go frog hunting, it's better to do it on a colder day because they kind of are, their blood is, uh, cold, is cool in it, it depending on the environment. Unlike most vertebrates or animals with backbones, they can do something miraculous and that's called metamorphosis. That means that they change. Only the other, there's other insects that change, but this is a vertebrate, which is very unusual. No other vertebrate can change its form like an amphibian. So go from water as a tadpole and then to an adult frog. Now, these guys also, when they're adults, they have a very smooth, sticky, moist, and highly porous. What, what that means is it's very holy. Because unlike um, people who, when we breathe, when we go oh, like that, we're breathing in air, their mouth doesn't do that. Their whole skin brings um, oxygen to their lungs. And so they're very different than us. But that's why they can tell us if something's wrong in a habitat. They also... Um, require water to lay eggs. So their eggs are gooey and messy and it requires and they float on top of the water and that's where they would hatch. And like I said before, they breathe through their skin, which is not the same as reptiles. So we're going to see that reptiles and amphibians only have two things really in common. So let's look here. A reptile, it's also a vertebrate. So if you look here, Notice the spine or the backbone in here. Now also snakes, and don't mistake, snakes are vertebrates. They have a backbone. They are not a worm. They might look like a big worm, but they are not. They are a reptile. Um, they have um, uh, scales on their skin, and they actually have to molt them, which is right here. This is a picture on the lower um, left-hand corner of a molt, or and they call it ecdysis, where th they have to remove their skin. Not like a, because remember we talked about insects before, and insects have to molt their exoskeleton. This is just the removing of the skin. Just like us, sometimes our skin kind of, we can go like this, and some of our skin cells, well, they take their skin cells to another, um, the level here. Now, unlike amphibians, they have to have eggs on dry land. And we're going to see some of our turtles. Um, they're now just laying their eggs. Uh, it is springtime. So also, too, a lot of people think that a turtle can come out of its carapace. That's what we call its shell on this side here. But the backbone is actually fused to the uh, carapace. So it cannot walk out. If you try to get the turtle to come walk out of its shell, it will not. You will kill it. And also, you never paint or put any chemical 
on the side of a turtle, it will also um, cause it to get sick. So that is the definition of an amphibian and reptile. Now, I want to read a little poem to you um, or a little story about frog tails. And this gives you the background of all the different types of frogs that we have here and how they are part of the food chain. So let's, um, let's read frog tails. Frog Tales by Michael Daughtery, animated by Doris Rea and ha Hagos Tavolti. Notice in this picture that there are one species of frogs with yellow eyes and one species of frog with blue eyes. Amphibian's poem. A male green frog sings his song. He sings it loud. He sings it long. Notice what that means is that only the boy frog or the male sings and the girl listens. He calls from his pond to attract a mate. He wants to have a special date. So he's looking for a girlfriend. The females choose whoever they like. Compared to her, he's a little tyke. The female frog is much larger than the male or boy frog. The amplexus is the long hug she'll get. The egg she deposits must stay wet. So frogs have this funny way of reproducing, um, which no other uh, group of organisms do this. The male squeezes the egg. Unlike a chicken that just lays an egg, the male frog needs to squeeze them out of her. In about a week, tadpoles hatch, thousands of them in a single batch. If you notice that the little frogs are in the eggs, they must be in water. Metamorphosis is an amazing change as tadpoles grow into things so strange. So they start from the egg and then they come out, they form these gills, and then they almost look like a fish and they actually act like a fish. They get their dissolved oxygen from the water. Legs appear as their tail go away. New things will grow day by day. So if you notice that their tail gets smaller, their uh, hind legs come out first, then their front legs. Gills go away as lungs breathe air. They can stay out of water if they dare. So now their lungs have developed where they now can breathe, but they are not like humans that breathe out of their mouth. They need to breathe from their skin. In about two years, they are fully grown to look for a pond they can call their own. So this is a green frog. Every frog has a different life cycle. Um, so it takes two years for a green frog to come out of the water and to be a fully grown adult frog. The end. I hope you like my poem. Now I would like to share some information from my new book. And what's her book? The cookbook. Hey, isn't that a cookbook? Who cares about that? Notice. The blue-eyed frog looks pretty bored. Remember when your teeth formed when you were about a month old? I gave you a homework assignment to memorize a list of things you can eat. Does anybody remember what tadpoles eat? Now first, frogs do have teeth. They're very small and they're in the back, but they do choose their food. Now let's see what tadpoles eat. Remember they're in the water algae, which is little green plants, and zooplankton, so little organisms that are in the water. That blue-eyed frog looks pretty bored. What do frogs eat? Zooplankton, insects. Hmm, so they eat the same except they don't eat, um, but they added insects to their diet. That's it. Can we go home now? And bad little frogs, 
class dismissed. Notice that um, Aunt Fibian actually ate the bored little blue-eyed frog. And that's because that is what happens in nature. The end as the grief green fog hops away. So as we can see here, frogs are kind of complicated. There is many, many, many different species of frogs. Some can live in cold areas, some can live in really hot areas, but there's very, um, there's a lot of them. And they tend to be the bottom of the food chain. Lots of animals, as we're going to see, depend on frogs to eat, especially a lot of our birds and fish. Um, so let's continue on. Um, let's take a look at amphibians at Tule Ponds. We actually only have three of them. One is called the Pacific Chorus Frog, one is called a Bullfrog, and one is called a Yellow-Legged Frog. Now, presently, we are having a major problem here at Tule Ponds. With all the construction around our area, um, the water table is doing weird things. And a lot of our tadpoles um, disappeared. And so where our creek disappeared um, because uh, the water district decided not to give us water anymore from an underground well, and we just having problems. So what happened was over the last two years, our population of frogs has gone down dramatically. And on the food web and the food chain, what happens is you lose the bottom part and it affects everything else. So let's take a look. So frogs are very, very important to tule ponds. So let's take a look at the different frogs that we have here. Now, let's take a look at, at a little video. I was having trouble getting um, some of these little um, frogs. Um, they're, they're not at, a, at, at its peak. But if you notice over here in the picture, that is a baby, or this is a tadpole, just starting its legs starting to come out. Um, now, what happens here is, let's take a picture, a close up of the Pacific Chorus Frog. If you notice, it has webbed feet. It has little, um, like suckers, because they can actually go up trees. And this is in the front here at Tule Ponds. It has this characteristic, um, brownish brown shades, but they can look very differently. But the diagnostic or the thing that tells you it's a Pacific chorus frog are these little um, suction cups that go up. They also produce a sound that is very, for a little guy like this, um, and that's why it's called a chorus frog, is because it's very, very loud. So in our, when we look at habitat pictures, we're gonna hear something that'll go rrr, rrr, rrr. That will be a chorus frog, a male trying to get a date. So Pacific chorus frog is a silly guy. The other thing that we have here is the yellow-legged frog. Um, however, this year I have not found any. Um, these are actually endangered um, in this area and we were trying to keep up a creek in the back, but the creek um, evaporated and um, kind of died away. So now we're working with the county and trying to get more water in there. But these guys are kind of cool. They become frogs very quickly. With almost three months, they can be a full um, a frog like this, and they can live up to eight years. So these are, um, uh, quick and uh, frogs that go pretty quickly. That's wh why we know we have them. I should have also mentioned the, um, the Pacific chorus frog also is very quick. Within a few uh, months, they are full grown. Um, the, these guys, the yellow-legged frog lives to be about eight years old. So they are found in Fremont, but rarely. So that they're put on the endangered species list. Now, the one that we do have the most here is the American bullfrog. Unfortunately, so if you guys had seen, I was playing with a little puppet like this. 
this one is considered a bullfrog because they're real big. We have seen eight pound bullfrogs here, which would be as almost as big as a cat. We have seen them eat little chicken, little uh, like baby ducklings. They can eat just about anything. Um, they are not native to our ponds and they tend to replace some of the other uh, frogs that we have here because they eat the yellow-legged and they also eat the little uh, peep, uh, the um, chorus frogs. Now these guys um, look different all the time. They're bumpy and warty um, and their tadpoles last for about one, two, um, oh actually I didn't change this guy so this is a little wrong here. Let, let me, um, I didn't put the real information. It takes two years for the bullfrog to become a from a tadpole to a frog. And these guys can live up to 20 years. So this is wrong over there. I made, it, I made a mistake. Um, but bullfrogs will just eat anything. And so in many ponds, they eat, they're the only frog that you can find, but they are part of the uh, southern part of the United States. So they are native in the United States. They just have been brought over here um, and they really eat everything else. So that's the American bullfrog. Now, they also have a funny sound. And what I'm going to show you is we're gonna show you, a, um, as we're walking around here at Tule Ponds, we're gonna look at the habitat. But frog hunting is very difficult. And we are going to allow um, families um, probably in June to start coming over here on the weekends um, where they can go hunting on their own, but not hunting to find them. So let's take a look at our habitats here. Frog and turtle habitat are a little bit different. Frogs require water to lay their eggs, where turtles don't need to lay their eggs in the water, but near the water so the young can find their way. Now, these kinds of areas are perfect for young turtles. A lot of times and here, frogs. if you don't remember what these are from some of our previous um, tours here at Tule Pond, these are tulies. Now, tulies grow in the water. They're not on the outside. They need to be totally submerged. So what happens in here, the tadpoles, baby fish, and um, like to hide from their predators because we have a lot of birds, a lot of herons, and a lot of egrets and osprey, um, a lot of birds that will eat these guys. And so the tulies is a perfect frog habitat. Now, we're going to go frog hunting. Now, frogs are hard to see because it's been, it was cold this week. I wasn't able to film too many of them. Um, but what we're going to look at is, and let's see if you can hear. So I'm not gonna talk very much, but I want you to hear, you'll hear a little beep, and you'll hear, and the little beep is baby, baby bullfrogs and then the one that's more hoarser would be your chorus frog even though it's littler so here we go frog hunting up in the front let's see if we can find any frogs in this area notice right after the rings whoop, i just heard something jump that little peeper sound that is a frog Catching them on film is not the easiest thing in the world. So let's see. Let go up closer. Mm. There's a whole bunch of frogs in here. <gasps> There's, see bullfrog? That was a big one. 
So about these frogs can just jump out of nowhere. You don't think they're there and they'll jump up. And like I said, that was about a two pounder. It went away real quick. And you have to be real quick to catch these guys um, in the first place. In the creek area, we tended to have a lot of the little peeper frogs and they're a little easier to, to catch. But bullfrogs, they do not want to be caught. So I'm sure I'm, uh, that you heard the two sounds of the frogs. And also the water, you might have noticed like, like a splash. That tells you that there's a frog underneath there. So it's just you, when we work here at Tule Ponds, you have to know what you're looking at. And there's always clues. The animals do not want to be found. Now here's another area in the back. This is where our yellow-legged frogs are. They come from Alameda Creek via um, underground springs. Um, but what happens in here, if you notice there's garbage that came out because it rained at the beginning of the week. Um, and these poor frogs have to deal with uh, human litter. But let's see if we can find, or in, in here, you'll see some jumping, but you'll also hear them. That was me with the rake. That's what that kind of, I was trying to scare them. But if you, if you noticed, if you looked at it, there was, I heard three, and I actually seen two jump. So those would have been probably three year old bullfrogs. Doesn't take them, takes them a long time to get really big. Now, this is part of the front where it says danger drop off. Um, if you come over here to Tule Ponds when we give you the dates, um, this area tends to have a bunch of frogs because it's kind of um, protected from the birds eating them. So let's go walk up to the area that says danger drop off. This area is hooked up to the other side of Walnut. There's a little um, pond over there. So let's walk and let's see if we can hear them or see them or see them uh, go into the water. So I heard three and I heard one plop in. What happens over here, a lot of times the, the, we have these pieces of wood just floating because a lot of time our baby chicks get stuck in there and so we have to kind of fish them out. But the bullfrogs and the peeper frogs like to hang out on the top and then they jump into the water when they are disturbed. So little areas like this are really good to go frog hunting. Now here at Tule Ponds though, we have some problems. Um, remember I talked about amphibians have that smooth skin and it can be ripped up pretty bad if we have plants that have thorns or that are sticky. So here at Tule Ponds, we, we usually have a lot of high school kids um, clear them out. This year we've had some problems because we haven't had as many kids as we, well, we haven't got any. Um, but let's take a look at this sticky bush. You would think this area would be a lush area for frogs. However, there's the sticky bushes that can rip the skin of the frogs, not only rip the skin, but also get stuck in the area. And then they make a seed that if they eat it or so they try the to roll over it, they'll get of, all stuck. Um, uh, students helping us keep the area clean because these are non-native plants. They don't belong here, but because their other seed is all around the environment, we have to almost physically remove them because you don't want to 
put an insecticide or I mean um, a herbicide, something that kills plants, because it will kill especially the amphibians. Because remember, they breathe through their skin, so they're usually the first animal to notice if there's any pollution. Now let's take a look at Himalaya blackberries. Here's a Himalaya blackberry. And you can see as I get closer to it, the thorns are thick enough to go and right And I've seen frogs actually stuck in these when frog. we're clearing them out. So that's a, um, a lot of people say, well, they're plants, why don't you let them stay? Well, they are, are deadly to many of our native animals. And so we're removing Himalaya blackberries is not native. Our, we do have a native blackberry, but it doesn't have these kind of nasty thorns. Now, on this uh, film here, this was at the beginning of the week when it was raining. Now notice here, this is a great blue heron and it has a frog. Now, we're going to look close and see if you could see the blue heron hunting for frogs. Let's take a look at who feeds on uh, tadpoles. This is a blue heron. And if you notice, he's perfectly quiet as he will find a prey and then now, if you notice with this blue it heron with here, its beak. it has, it puts its neck back and whenever it sees a prey, it's like lightning. It goes down and, and just gets the prey in between its uh, beak. It's pretty awesome to see, but frogs are their preferred dinner, even bullfrogs. Now, let's take a look. We do have more reptiles at Tule Ponds at Tyson's Lagoon, then we do have amphibians, um, and but they hide. A lot of times it's very rare to kind of see them, but when you see them, um, you know they're there. Turtles tend to be in the water and they just put their little head up. Um, they only come out once in a while to, to um, lay their eggs, which we do see about now. The snakes, on the other hand, and the lizards, they like to hide. So I only have a few pictures of them because um, I just got my video camera. So I just started taking video. But let's take a look at the reptiles at Tule Ponds. Okay, now. This is the Western Pond Turtle. Now this is, um, used to be very abundant. It, it's been in Fremont for at least 4,000 years. We have, uh, we find them, um, or more than 4,000 years because it comes from the Ice Age. We have fossil of them that are probably over um, 100,000 years old. They unfortunately are declining in population because they don't have habitat in which to lay their eggs, which we're going to look at. We also have the problem of too many cars. And just imagine a car, because these guys are slow, they're going across a, a ro roadway. And the biggest things that kill a lot of the Western Pond Turtle are cars that just run over them. And when they run over them, that's the end of this turtle. Like this turtle here, is over about 25 years old. So it takes them a long, long time. Um, they can live to 50 years. They eat fish, uh, tadpoles, insects. They eat a lot of um, uh, stuff that are in a lake. Um, they have, um, uh, they, ha they, they make eggs in different kind of what we call clutches. Um, and so what they do is they have, um, they make a hole and then they lay maybe a few eggs and then bury it up. Um, so let's take a look at what we're, okay, oh, it's gonna be later. This is how we try to help them with their nursery. Turtles have a hard time finding places for their eggs. They try to avoid predators. What we do here is we teach high school kids to make areas with thick chips so the animals can lay their eggs. Then we try to naturally protect them and it needs to be close to the water. So a turtle nursery and when the is babies real specific hatch, around they can go here right in. because they need to have an area where they can um, uh, hide them. Usually they like sand or a muddy sand. 
Um, and then because we have just a small area, we make these nursery areas so we can protect them. But you notice it just looks like a, um, just a kind of a lush place, but underneath there, they can lay their egg. Now let's look at how they actually Turtles have lay their eggs. Walking down the steps here at Tule Ponds and look what I found. A turtle, female turtle laying her eggs on the top of the stairs. Not a very good place. If however these are eggs, I will eggs. dig she them really up wasn't and put them in a safe there. place. What, she, what turtles do is that they make a lot of these empty nests um, trying to get predators to go to the different nest and, and dig them up and then not find them. It's kind of like a game because who eats them? Raccoons do over here. They'll dig them up and eat them. Now, this is a Western pond. This is, uh, this one's about 20 something years old. Um, it, because I come close, it puts its head in, but you can see it uses its back legs. And you notice here, it's kind of gooey. Well, they have um, areas where they have water in their back here where they lay the, when they're digging, they mix it in with water. So if you picked up this, um, if you pick him, her up, water will come out. It's like she's peeing on you, but it's really just water. But this, we, this is what they're doing right now, finding their areas to lay eggs. Now, we also have another one that looks like a Western pond. We call them the red-eared slider turtle. Um, it is not native to this area. Um, they are from the southern part of the United States, but they have, if you notice right here, it's red and they have more their um, carapace or their back here is much more um, ornamented than the other, uh, the, the Western pond turtle. These are tended to be um, pets. And so we have had lots of people have these pets because they buy them when they're little, like one year old. And then when they get to be like, this one's about 30 years old, they get too big and then they bring them over here. So that's why they're here. Now we also have the Western fence lizard. If you live in Fremont or the East Bay, you can find this, what they also call the blue belly lizard. Um, they're common in the Western United States. Um, they hibernate, that means they go to sleep in the winter and they eat a lot of insects. The female has like one to three uh, clutches um, with about three to eight eggs that will hatch in August. But why is it called? Reptiles like to hide. Can you find the reptile here? This is a blue belly. If you notice these guys have really noticeable scales along here. Now, why is it called a blue belly? This is a blue belly lizard. Very common here in Fremont. Why is it called a blue belly? It has a blue. So if you notice, um, you can, they, they don't hurt you at all. So, but if you notice how these scales come out, they have, um, they kind of protrude out. So it's really, I know a lot of kids that love hiding, hunting for a blue belly. Now, snakes at Tule Ponds. Our snakes are very hard to find, but you see evidence of them all over the place. All around Tule Ponds, you'll find holes like this. Now those are too big for a gopher, but it's not too big for a gopher snake so you see or a these garden holes snake, all which over both the place. inhabit this area. Some of our snakes are quite large. This is the Pacific gopher snake. Um, they can get up to eight feet long. They eat a lot of small mammals. They're very thick. Um, but they don't hurt you. Uh, sometimes on our field trips, we will encounter them and the kids all scream, but they won't, they're more scared of you. Uh, and notice that their head is small compared to their size. That's a difference between the other common one, which is the, the gardener snake. And this one has uh, stripes. This one's a little bit smaller. It eats the same thing and they like grassy areas. So that's a, a lot of times we won't allow the children to run in the grassy areas because that's where the snakes are hiding. Now, 
this is kind of, it almost looks like a worm. I know that's a big picture, but these guys almost look like worms. It's called a sharp tailed snake. I have only seen them reproduce once and they came out in a big swarm um, where I, at first I thought they were worms. I had never heard of this kind of uh, tail before. Because if you can look over here, it has a sharp tail on at the end of the tail. Um, but they do like moist areas and they eat lots of snails and slugs and they're very secretive. Like I said, I've only seen them once and it was kind of like an event. I was walking and they were just all over this trail and I, I came to get my camera and by the time I came back, they were gone. <laughs> Okay, now we're going to take a look now how to actually start um, learning about amphibians and reptiles, because you wouldn't believe how many things that are, are really out there. from the frog to the vulture to the gorilla to the tiger to the crocodile to the shark um, there's many ways in which you can um, let your children use the materials that they have already and to learn from them yeah because if you're looking at this one right here this is a a, a peeper frog it's a chorus frog and it has those little suction cups area. The eyes are in the right place. Um, and so sometimes you can make realistic looking uh, puppets and you can compare and contrast. It's a very good way of um, having your child, look. anytime you see something in the store is to see, is it, is it correct? Like this is a little uh, baby turtle and this one actually will go into its area and it can't come out. Sometimes you'll buy toys that the turtle can actually come out and that's not the way it is. Now, on the other hand, I brought my other friend, the bullfrog here. And the only thing that's realistic about him is that he's big. And like I said, bullfrogs can get big, but um, not really realistic. But if you got to remember things like even Sesame Street, one of the main characters is Hermit the Frog. Um, children just tend to like frogs. Now, this is um, a frog sound. I'm going to bring this one up so you can actually um, see it. So I'm going to play it a little. Frogs are enjoyed by many cultures. This is an artist's rendition. I think this is from Indonesia. And if you think about it, what sound does a frog make? Um, we call ribbit, ribbit. But listen to this. Kind of sounds like a frog, doesn't it? Yeah, and there's many different ways in which I want to just take a look at this. This was hand carved. And it's just the, the way you can make it. And they have some ceremonies in Indonesia where they use that sound. And the little ones have little sharper sounds. And it because it's, it's kind of like a musical instrument. Because if you think about it at night, there's music here at Tuli Ponds all the time with all these animals talking and trying to find friends and whatever. Also, a lot of times in educational uh, toy areas, they might have kind of these silly things that you go like, what do you do with it? Well, like on this, instead of dissecting a real frog, you can actually like take the pieces out and then learn the insides of a, a frog. Dissecting frogs in, the, in high schools used to be a mandatory, but now we don't do that anymore. Um, and that's probably why there's a lot of bullfrogs around because those were the common dissection tool. Um, so, so that's one way. Now, there's lots of other educational toys that can help um, teach more about frogs. Because if you look in your, your toy areas, there's an awful lot of frogs. Frogs are all over education. Kids love frogs. For instance, frog pond fractions. You have the frog life cycle stamps. You have bean bags. You have puzzles. You have many, many things based on frogs.
Yeah, you'd be surprised as you start looking around your house how many different toys you have that have to deal with frogs. Um, my favorite, one of my favorites is always playing with these little plastic animals. Um, as you look at these, these are the comparing the reptiles and amphibian models. Uh, you may think that some of these are kind of odd looking, um, that they're not quite real. Like look at the one on the, you see at the top left, the one with the spots, that's actually made to look like a newt. Um, some of these might be salamanders. So those would still be amphibians. Uh, the reptiles are gonna be more again, like your lizards. So they do at first kind of all look alike, but they're very, very different. Um, so again, these models are a good way to compare and contrast, um, as well as compare and contrast if they're how true they are, how correct they are to the real thing. And that's where you can use your nature books uh, to compare and contrast as well. All right, now this is a fun um, activity, even with the turtles. Um, if you think about how you grow over time, and you, as you grow, you have to get new sizes of clothes. Well, a turtle, as it grows from a small baby, it also has to grow, and it has to be able to grow new parts of its shell. So those little pieces of paper that we've cut up, those are those to, to be those, what we call scoots. Um, the scoots are individual pieces, and as a turtle grows, some of those scoots will, will kind of um, peel off or flip off. Um, sometimes if a turtle has too much algae on their shell, they'll also expose some of those flutes and, and, and switch some of those off. Um, so the scoots do kind of peel off. If you're not taking great care of your turtle, they can get fungus and other diseases as well. Um, but that's also another fun way of um, identifying those turtles because they all have different patterns. So this is just an activity using just a paper um, bowl and just tearing up either fabric that you have or pieces of paper, um, tissue paper, just gluing them on. And again, trying to make your model as realistic as you can to the, to the things that we have there at Tuli Ponds. Um, again, we've just, you see, have made a small tail four feet and a small head. So there is actually room in that um, turtle's shell to be able to pull those legs in and the head and tail in a little bit, um, possibly not all the way, but they can pull again um, in for protection. But remember, they cannot leave that shell. That shell is actually a very important part of their skeleton. All right, now this is kind of fun too. We've made some examples here of reptiles and amphibians. And then we've got a bunch of just different pictures. So as you find pictures, or if you even have those little models, you can go through and kind of decide which, which section they go in. Are they reptile or are they amphibian based on their, based on their um, characteristics? So our reptile, you'll see again, two eyes, the mouth, and then you'll see the amphibian, kind of more bulgy eyes and kind of a curled tongue. eat. If you don't remember, go back through those storybooks. Again, they're online. We'll have a link to it so you can go back through and you can figure out what it is that those frogs eat. All right, and one of our favorites at Tuli Ponds is trying to remember the habitat. Now this is going to be easier to do once you've gotten a chance to come to Tuli Ponds and see it, but even from the storybooks that we've had, um, you'll get an idea of what kind of habitat is needed for frogs to live. Think about what does a frog need to live? It needs a lot of water, some moisture, needs lots of plants. Think about what the frog would eat, okay? And then um, again, we try to make a just a little model of what that habitat might look like. All right, and our life cycle of a frog. When you come to Tuli Ponds, we've got all of these models that you can play with. So it goes again from the eggs, the tiny little eggs, to being a tadpole. And then the tadpole always has its first leg that to come out as the, ball, as the back right leg, because the first one always come out. 
and then that tail gets slowly absorbed back into the body, and then you've got your full adult frog. So again, there are lots and lots of examples on Pinterest, on the web, um, things that you can find that are some good art activities uh, that have to do with frogs and amphibians and other reptiles. Okay, so we're going to um, read you one more story um, about through a frog's eye. And this is actually was done by um, two students from Mission High School um, back in 2004. Um, so we're going to read the story so you guys understand the importance of this habitat and how these frogs are an important part of it. Then after that, we'll um, talk a little bit more about any questions you might have about what we've gone over um, and then where you can find more information. And we'll also talk a little bit more about how you'll be able to come and visit Tule Ponds with your families. We're gonna limit the number of people, so we'll, we'll probably do reservations. We'll have more information about that um, next time because next time we're going to do uh, water and we're gonna do bubbles and we're gonna do a whole bunch of cool things next week. But right now, let's finish up on Through a Frog's Eye. Through a Frog's Eye, Restoring Mission Creek, Fremont, California, by Ye April Yang and Francis Wong, animated by Doris Rea. This was a contest that we had at Mission Creek uh, when we were restoring it, and these two young ladies um, wrote this book and were the winners. It was a lazy summer afternoon. The air was hot and stuffy. Little Pacifica Frog went to visit her grandmother at Mission Creek. Grammy lived in the most lush and greenest plants under a tangled sycamore tree. Frogs prefer the refreshing water under the sycamore trees to the spicy stagnant pool around the eucalyptus trees. Knock, knock, is anybody home? Croak Little Pacifica. Coming, coming, Grammy said hoarsely. She unfastened a piece of grass that held the door closed on her Thule house. Little Pacifica hopped in happily. Pacifica lives downstream with her family in a nearby lagoon, but during the summer, it gets real hot. Pacifica, I missed you so much, exclaimed Grammy. She proceeded to give Pacifica a sticky froggy kiss and handed her a chilled frog aid. You only visit me because it's nice and wet here with all these oaks and sycamore giving us shade, teased Grammy. Not true, said little Pacifica. I'm here because you promised to tell me the story of Mission Creek, remember? That's right, Grammy exclaimed. For as long as I can remember, I have lived in Mission Creek. Back in the old days, I used to live in a newspaper stand. It was stuck in the mud, but it was the only shady place, so I made a home out of it. Back then, the creek was in terrible shape. The creek banks were eroded, so us creek critters always had a difficult time getting around. During the floods, we'd always have to scramble out of the creek because debris would hit us. That's scary. You could have been killed, said Little Pacifica. You're right, Grammy continued on. There were so many eucalyptus trees that wildflowers and green bushes couldn't grow. Without these, life was hard for us frogs, reptiles, insects, and birds. My friend, Busy Bee, was so upset that there was no flowers to make honey. She left with a long, hmm, many creatures left. That is sad, Grammy, Little Pacifica interrupted. No friends to play with? The pre-restoration days were lonely, sighed Grammy. I remember a time when I couldn't hear any birds singing. The only birds around were the turkey vultures, and they don't sing. The turkey vultures love the high trees, and they would soar on the wind. They just look for dead animals to feast on. So it was just a few of us miserable frogs croaking the blues. 
Pacifica was taking a big gulp of the frog eggs when Grammy, Grammy suddenly yelled, Do you know why the creek was in such bad condition? Grammy's voice had been so loud that she scared the fried frog egg right out of Pacifica's hand. It hit her sticky web feet with a big splash. Grammy angrily croaked on. Many suns ago, there appeared some colorful giants. They built homes and grew orchards. They didn't think about the creek critters and what we needed to survive. Many creek critters left for wetter areas. Is that so? Little Pacifica was surprised by the story. Grammy went on. The giant selfish use of the waters and paving of the ground with concrete and asphalt caused erosion. It narrowed the creek channels in some places and caused deep gullies. The erosion caused the water to become murky and choked with silk. I don't know how I survived all those years in that newspaper stand. The giants finally got the hint that our creek needed some help. They called it restoration and asked us to leave for a little while. I gladly picked my bags and hopped away for a few months. Some of those resortful giants were able to get money to fix our, to fix our creek and help us creek critters. When I returned, the creek gently meandered instead of flowing right through. So the water went slower and we could actually cross the creek. They put koi logs, straw wattles, and large boulders called riprap in special places to control the erosion, sediment, and storm run runoff. They removed many of the eucalyptus trees, but left some behind for the turkey vultures, so they still had a home. Now the vultures have a better view of us, so you better watch when you are out there playing. Thank you for warning me, Grammy, Little Pacifica nervously croaked. Grammy went on. Now all of us creek critters can share in our beautiful creek. We can enjoy the native trees that were here before the giants lived in the area. But we can now keep some of the non-native trees that the giants planted. Pacifica was so proud of her Grammy. Her Grammy was the only frog she knew that had seen the effects of the restoration firsthand. Pacifica decided to spend the summer with Grammy so she can learn all about the trees, shrubs, and other creek critters. Best of all, it was always nice and cool in Mission Creek. The end. Now, Mission Creek is between Mission San Jose um, Chadbourne Elementary and Hopkins and you can walk along the back there it's still um, in pretty good shape right now this is 20 almost 20 years after um, the restoration was developed but it took in this story actually we did find because it talked about a the frogs being in um, um, a newspaper stand and that actually was pretty true. We found this big newspaper stand. There was actually several of them. I don't know what they were doing in the creek. And we had high school kids ex excavate them out. And who was in there was a bunch of frogs. And so that's where this story actually started, which is another way in which when you have an experience with um, children, is that for them to write things down, even to make a story that has a, um, um, has a, a meaning to it. 